Welcome to Chat Room. On tonight's program, I'm really privileged to welcome Terry Waite, who's an author, a lecturer, a diplomat, uh, a humorist, the recipient of a CBE, an MBA, many times honorary doctorates, and is most famous for being taken hostage um, for four years between 1987 and 1991 in Lebanon. And it was, it was not a happy time in solitary confinement. But he's come out of it, and he has had a tremendous career in helping other families um, who have suffered what his family did when he was in confinement, and gone on to write numerous best-selling books. And he's now here in the Hawke's Bay. In the Hawke's Bay, yes. Well, this is the third year that I've been out to New Zealand, um, consecutive year, and uh, I'm staying with friends. Uh, we hire a house. We come out in January. Get away from the flooding. From the flood, terrible flooding. Terrible flooding in the UK. Yeah, my house in England, fortunately, is above the water. That's excellent. But you know, only the other day, a thousand houses went down, went under water, and it's really sad for those people who are who are suffering. Anyway, we come away in January, here yeah, January, February, and uh, until the first week of March, and the reason for coming is to give me space in what is a busy program, uh, to, to write. And I wrote a book, a comic novel last year, which is a new departure, and uh, I'm Can doing a sequel. Can you tell me the, total, the title? The title is called The Golden Handshake. <laughs> and that's the name of a ship, because the, the, the novel is about uh, cruising on the high seas. And uh, it's... Uh, Based on fact, I mean, I've done a lot of lectures on board ship in my time. Over 30 years, I think I've been lecturing, you know, once or twice a year on board ship from anything from the QE2, QM2, and what have you, and the, the smaller lines, which are actually very nice to sail on. So I thought I'd write a comic novel about that, based on actual happenings, but sort of exaggerated to make them even, even more ludicrous than they were in reality. <laughs> And you enjoy that. I do enjoy writing, yes. But I don't, you know, you've got to get away. And where could be nicer and better than New Zealand summer, which is not too hot. You don't get the midges that you get over in Australia. That's um, a secret. That's a secret. Australians don't like to tell you that. No, no, they don't. About they, the flies that come in your mouth when you're having a conversation, when you're walking on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> but you get it really, it's really lovely here. It is. And I can get the piece to write, you know, which is really what I want. So do you doing any of the diplomatic activity that you were involved in your whole life? Well, yes. I mean, um, I have a, my secretary is back in London, and we have constant email contact and Skype contact and what have you. And uh, actually, at this very moment, only, only last night, I had an appeal on behalf of several journalists who are held up in, um, in Egypt. I mean, there were 20 journalists uh, imprisoned in Egypt for doing their job, for actually reporting on the situation. And they're being accused of cohorting with terrorists. And some of them are from Al Jazeera. Uh, so Al Jazeera, there are, I think there are seven from Al Jazeera. Uh, one from Sky, there's an Australian, uh, Peter Gresty, who, who's with Al Jazeera. And what they're doing is their normal job. I mean, the job of a journalist is to report impartially. And once you start to stop that process in any country of the world, eventually that country suffers because uh, we, we depend on journalists very often for... Uh, for our information. Otherwise, we're going to get biased information from governments. We're going to get biased information from people who are prejudiced against the, uh, against the situation. And so, therefore, um, it's really important that those of us who are care for freedom of speech uh, actually make our voice known when people like that get imprisoned. So I'm, I'm actually... Uh, we're going to make an appeal for them very shortly. Do you know the organization? Because there's numerous organizations that are taking well, hostages they've been at this taken point. By the, they've been taken by the current government, and there are... There are the two military government as yes. opposed to the Islamic government? Yes, they're taken by the military government at the moment, and there are two um, prisons in, in Egypt. Some are in one prison and some are in the other. One prison is specially built uh, to house... 
uh, those who are considered to be really dangerous terrorists. Well, it's nonsense to put these uh, journalists in there. Nonsense. Do we know what the conditions are? Conditions are poor. I read a letter last night from one of the uh, prisoners, that was from the Australian actually, who said that he had for the first time been able to experience the fresh air and walk outside. He just got a short time outside his cell. Well, I know what that's like because I did five years in virtually almost five years in solitary confinement uh, when I was working for the release of hostages in Beirut. And during that time, I think I only saw the sky on about two occasions. How did you keep your sanity? Uh, the assumption behind that is I kept my sanity. <laughs> uh, I, what you have to do when you're in a situation of extremity like that, and mercifully very few people will find such extreme circumstances. I mean, I was kept in an underground prison to initially, and then later on in bombed out buildings. I had uh, no natural light, uh, sometimes electric light, sometimes a candle, um, no natural light at all. If I was in a room above ground, metal shutters were put in front of the window. And uh, I had no books and papers or anything for over uh, three years. Eventually I got some, but after three years. And what you have to do in a situation of extreme depravity, depravity like that on, and deprivation is to learn to live from within. Use your imagination. Um, I wrote my first book in my head during those years, which is called Take Non Trust. And, uh, which is I've, still in print <laughs> and does I very well. I found it over here in the second-hand bookshop. Did you? <laughs> that could be a blessing or a disguise. Uh, well, you never know, do you? There I, I was on the shelf. So I said to the proprietor, um, "Let me. I'll sign it. You can put the price up. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah, but anyway... Um, yeah, I found, I found, I still in print uh, after, well, it's, you know, since I was released now, it's over 20 years, believe it or not. That's amazing. It That's is. It is, but it's still, it's still in print. And uh, it records the experience of those years, um, which are not always easy. And, and, you know, but many people have suffered deprivation. And fortunately, I came out with my life. Many people who were imprisoned did alongside me did not. Well, we have to go for a break. And when we come back, I want to go back a little bit and talk about how you got involved in diplomacy and negotiation. Good. We'll be back in chat room with Terry Waite in a minute. Uh, Welcome back to chat room. We're speaking with Terry Waite. Okay, Terry. Uh -huh. So you were born in Cheshire, right? And you worked um, in always with, this is one thing that interests me. Why didn't you go in the Foreign Service? Why were you always sort of a ch in church diplomacy? Because as I a was layman? too dumb, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't pass the Foreign Service no, exam. <laughs> I couldn't spell. <laughs> no. no, the thing was, um, I, I, I went into the church, um, but I never wanted to be ordained. And many people think I'm a clergyman. You know, when they meet me, they realize I'm not. But, um, but the church base actually gives you a good opportunity to do what I wanted to do. Which was? Which was, well, I wasn't always clear, but it was something in the humanitarian line. You know, something that actually was a service to people. Was that something you were raised with? Was the uh, no, my father, was a, my father was a village policeman. Um, and I was brought up in a, a village police station in Cheshire, in the north of England. But I had that desire to do that. And I, I thought, well, let me, let me try this. And in fact, it was a very good move. But it does mean, you know, if you work with the church as a lay person without turning your collar around and becoming ordained, you can say goodbye to any chances of promotion. You know, you're not going to go up, you're not going to be a bishop or anything like that. You're going to remain a layman. And in some ways, you're more exposed to the, to the risks of life. You know, you don't have the protection of office. But that's not a bad thing because it keeps you on your toes. You don't become dead and, and hopefully not boring. Well, you're almost like the Secretary of State to the bishops and the archbishops in the well, position that you were in. Yeah, what happened eventually was that uh, after working in various positions, and, and you asked a question a moment ago, which I didn't answer fully, 
about being always interested in humanitarian work. Yes, when I was a student, I mean, I worked with the homeless um, and tried to do something on their behalf. Aren't and you now chairman of Habitat for Humanity? I am. Uh, I've been uh, associated with Habitat, Habitat and still am, yes. And also, I'm a president of an organization called Emmaus, which isn't a religious organization, but is an organization which enables homeless people to get back into life. And it's not just a, it's an organization to dole out help and, this, um, and money and what have you. It actually provides a location where they can live, where they can find work, and where they can gain their dignity as human beings. And that's widespread across Europe. And it's not out here. Uh, it's not even in the United States. Pity needs it in the United it States. Needs in the United very, States. very much. It needs it there. Anyway, uh, so that's what. So I you started. It, um, you started doing this. You wanted to do humanitarian work. You were an education advisor to the Anglican Bishop of Bristol. That's right. And you were there until you were posted to East Africa in yeah, 1969. Right. Mm -hmm. And you worked as a provincial training advisor. To, uh, in Uganda mm -hmm. and Rwanda and Burundi, where, and when you were living there, the wonderful Mr. Idi Amin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If ever you've seen that film, I the, have. The Last King of Scotland. It's fabulous. Isn't it amazing? He's amazing. He's an amazing performer. An amazing actor. But and by how word, to, he to captures it. You know, he captures as Amin. I mean, I had my first uh, real stab at negotiations at that level with. General Amin. And what were you negotiating for? Were you, were you there during Entebbe? I was in Entebbe. I was living in Uganda, in Kampala. And uh, Amin came to power. And many of my colleagues were seized and thrown into those uh, terrible jails. Um, and some died. And I had to try and go and work for their release. That was my first major experience of actually engaging in that type of activity. I mean, I had lots of negotiating experiences, but not at that level, and that level of difficulty too. Was he, was he completely um, dense? I mean, was he so infatuated with himself that was the portrayal in the film? I remember the first time I ever met him, and he came to power, when he'd just come to power and Oboti had been overthrown. And he came to address the House of Bishops in uh, Kampala. And I was, a, I was working directly with the then uh, Archbishop of Uganda, who was the first African Archbishop, Erika Sabiti. And he came to power at that point, uh, Min came to power, and he came to address the bishops. And strangely enough, he was very nervous. His English was very halting. He, he stumbled and stuttered his way through. Uh, and then I saw him afterwards, and he became much more confident. But, you know, there were many amazing experiences out there. On the morning of the coup, I remember getting up and uh, going to see a colleague of mine who, uh, well, his wife was alone because he'd gone into uh, Kenya that previous day. And I went to see if she was all right. And as I was going to the house, uh, a tank rumbled towards me. And it trained the turret on the car, on my car. <laughs> and, you know, so I stopped. I did what you normally would do in Africa in a situation like that. Wound the window down, looked out and said, hello, morning. <laughs> <laughs> and they all waved back. <laughs> and how long <laughs> after the, the coup did you get out of Uganda? Uh, oh, a um, couple of years, I think. It was a couple of years afterwards. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I stayed for the length of the time I was expected to stay over there. I was there with my wife and, and family. My son, who's the youngest, we've got four children, uh, he was born there. And we've all been back. I mean, for my 70th birthday, uh, I took all the family back um, just to see the place where, they, where the girls, I've got three daughters, where they went to school. And my son, the place where he was born, and try and get his birth certificate, which we found. You know, amazingly, Amazing. amazingly in, a, in that uh, complex archive. So it was a good visit. Excellent. And then um, after that, you went to Rome. You were a consultant, you, another church. Yep. The Anglicans were, you know, you progressed, I guess some might think. <laughs> 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 and um, then you worked for 
in Rome for a while. Yeah, I worked in Rome. I a little nicer than. Well, it was Kampala. a it was a very interesting seven. Uh, it was a bit very big difference from Kampala. Yeah, we were there seven years in Rome, and but I was hardly ever in Rome because I was traveling all over the world to trouble spots all over the world, uh, working uh, either on the questions of reconciliation, largely between. Uh, different groupings who were at war with each other. Islamic uh, Christian conflict was beginning to develop in the Philippines, in the southern Philippines. Um, I was down there. And then also in the development of health institutions to enable the big hospitals to become more relevant to the needs of the people so that they could change from being purely curative establishments to become more preventative health uh, locations. And that was one one brief, and that was a very big task all over the world. So, how, how was your family life? I mean, if you were never home, um, they were very relieved. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they said, "Oh, thank goodness!" <laughs> Fine. You know, the great thing about that, there are many people who have to spend time away from from family. Um, and just think of airline pilots yeah. or ships captains and so on. The the great secret is, if you've got children. Um, Make sure that every year you have a good family holiday. Um, go away together. And we, we went away every year, you know, for three weeks if we could make it, sometimes a little longer if we could. And um, when, I, when the, the, young, the girls were in Africa, when they were young children, you know, they don't look back on bad memories, on, on the terror and misery which, through which I experienced. You know, I've witnessed murders and lynchings and what have you. They look back on the, the smiling African, the happy African, the sunshine, the days on the beach in Mombasa. And children are more resilient than often people give them credit for. I agree. Providing, providing you, know, you pay them attention when you, you're there uh, for them. You're there for them. Then you can be away. That's fine. We have to go for a break. Again, and when we come back. No, so do we soon. get a coffee? <laughs> we can go across the street and get a coffee. Don't go away, as they say. You know, come back. <laughs> when we come back, we'll talk about Lebanon and Syria and okay. the Middle East. We'll be back at chat room with Terry Waite in a minute after he has his coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to chat room. We're here with Terry Waite, who's going to talk a little bit about some more of his experiences. So, in 1980, we're back. We're back to your past. Yeah. You were recruited by Archbishop Runcie. One of the things I wanted to ask you before we go on, you're a big opposing man. Do you think that has a lot to do with your ability to negotiate? Uh, it can be a blessing on the one hand, and it can be intimidating on the other, because sometimes little people feel they've got to kick you. <laughs> 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 no, they do. It's true. Um, so it's a mixed blessing, a mixed blessing. So you went to work for Runcie, and so then I was a kid, not too young, don't worry, in the United States when, um, the, when after the Iranian Revolution and the Shah is kicked out and these Americans are held hostage, which was the dramatic, most dramatic thing of the Jim Carter administration. And I remember seeing your face every night on television because that's when Nightline started. There was this 11 o'clock mm -hmm. news program that would say every day that these Americans were held hostage. And here you are, and I think a representative of a church which probably enabled you to negotiate with the Hezbollah. Unquestionably, that and that's a very good point. You know, they, has, um, in Iran, the revolutionary guards had respect for uh, a religious leader, for Robert Rumsey, who was Archbishop of Canada. They had respect for him. That is one of the reasons why I was able to get access to them and work with them. And what is not so widely known, you mentioned quite rightly, the Americans who were captured. But there were British people who were captured also. Uh, John Coleman, Audrey Coleman, both doctors. Jean Waddell opened the door one night of her flat, uh, was shot, left for dead. Had not her neighbor been uh, a medical practitioner, she'd have died. When she made a recovery of sorts, she was thrown into the um, great Avene prison. And several Iranians. So I went out there to negotiate directly with uh, the, re the revolutionary guards. Um, was able to get into the Avene prison, was able to meet Jean, was able to bring them all home eventually without payment, with no ransom payment and no false exchange. Because you were representative of a religious leader and not a government. Well, because I was willing to try and get. It's a long story, and I should be telling this story when I give the brief lecture um, in, in the next uh, couple of weeks over in uh, Waipora. 
In Waipawa? Waipawa. And where is that going to be? It's going to be at the theatre there. They've got the wonderfully it's new, renovated theatre. It's lovely. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, my, my, my Irish father-in-law will go. Really? Yeah, he doesn't always go to these things, but he'll go to hear you. <laughs> yeah, bring him along. It's on the 27th. Uh, at 7 o'clock in the evening in the theatre. I'm going to be telling these stories Excellent. in more detail so yes. that people will have some understanding of some of the things that do go on, you know, in these places where so different than life in New Zealand. So you had the trust or the trust in quotes of this revolutionary guard. Yeah. So the day that you were captured, you went to this doctor's house? Who yeah, but I, I wasn't uh, captured in, in Iran. I mean, first of all, there was the Iranian hostages I released. Secondly, I met Gaddafi. Another wonderful another, human being. Another remarkable man. I was in Libya when uh, people were captured in Libya and went out there, discussed with him. I'll tell something of what Gaddafi was like as well, and how I got on with him and what happened there. I went to Beirut at a time when many hostages were taken, was able to get some people out of Beirut, and then because of political duplicity, which again I'll talk about, but there won't be time now, because we're running in the last eight minutes. I know, I know, we have we're to running. hurry, we have to sprint. <laughs> <laughs> we have to sprint now, we're coming for the finishing line. Exactly. Yeah, and so and I was able to get some people out in Beirut, and then finally found that trust was broken, and bang, I was in jail. And That's amazing. it. Amazing. So that yeah. day that you met, was it like any other day that you were meeting with? Well, um, I knew. Uh, they, they promised me safe conduct. They said, you can see hostages who are sick and ill. And I had to make a decision. And I thought, I could walk away from this. But if I walk away, I'm going to have to live with my conscience for the rest of my life of walking away from somebody who's dying. And I wasn't prepared to do it. So Did I went, and they brought the word, and bang, I was in prison. Did you think that they were going to treat you well or better than they had the other hostages no. because of your international no. reputation? No. Uh, it might even be worse, you know. I mean, I did, and again, I'll tell this story, but not now. I suffered a mock execution. I had um, various forms of, of torture. And, um, but the great thing, and, and this is something, you know, this is a link between ordinary life and that extreme experience, and it's this, that life is uh, life with, with suffering in life. Everybody suffers in one way or another, some to a greater extent than others, some to a lesser extent. And it's never easy. I mean, anybody who's listening to this and know and is suffering from illness or has seen people suffer from illness will know how difficult it is or suffer from family tragedy. But the great thing to remember in all of it is that at the end of the day, suffering need not destroy. Something creative can emerge from it, if you're willing to work. That's in the majority of cases. It's very difficult to see that at the time. And I thought in those years, they were wasted, empty years. But they're not, because, in a strange sort of way, they brought me to see you. <laughs> Uh, recently, yeah. there's been this uh, speculation yeah. that it wasn't, um, you know, that, that your release yeah. was based not, um, was a new secret negotiation, that they blamed, wait, what, how do I go? Oh, yeah, no, I've heard it. You've heard it. I've that heard it, it, yeah. that it was not, that it was not. Uh, the, and they were I, trying to transfer blame yeah. from... Uh, from one party to I even I get confused from, now. From Iran, from from, 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 Iran, Li from Libya, from Libya to Iran. That's right, it. Right. That's it. They were trying to transfer. Well, you know, when you move around in those political circles, you realise it's an absolute so quagmire. Yeah. And very, <laughs> very, it's usually years later that the actual truth of what happened comes out. Did they have to pay for your release? No, as far as I know, not a pe not a bean, not a bean. I, I th I've got my own theory as to how I came to be released. Just, we'll end with that. I, I, I'm going, I'm going to, well, no, I'm not going to tell you Because now. you have to go to your lecture. I've got to, it's got to, <laughs> you've got to go to the lecture to hear it. <laughs> you may not want to hear it. But, I, <laughs> but I, then, I will, I've got my own theory about that. I will but, end with saying that you have an organization called Hostage UK where you support yeah. families. Yeah, and, that, and that's, uh, that's important because we actually do give support to hostage families. Uh, I set up this organization mm -hmm. a few years ago. It works globally. And uh, the proceeds are not going into my um, coffers to help pay for me to go to Figaro. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're actually <laughs> going to, to they're away. actually going to <laughs> Hostage UK. That's great. And so, um, if you come along, you'll not only be hearing an interesting lecture, you'll also be supporting some of those poor people who are feeling pretty miserable around the world. Well, our eight minutes are up. <coughs> you can go have your cup of coffee. Another one. <laughs> Another one. And um, I hope you'll come back and speak some more to us because there's you. many stories that you have yet to tell. Good. And thanks for stopping by, Terry. Fine. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. That's and a all pleasure. success in your singing career. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's it for chat room for tonight.